This morning, our scripture verses come from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You can follow along on the screen. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for you because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from the east and the west. I will say to the north and the south, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, before Sunday school started, we were talking about the topography of Pennsylvania. The hills that we have versus the flatlands of Kansas and how no matter where we go, there's a hill. But sometimes, all we see is the immediate hill in front of us. When we get to another vantage point, like I can pick out a place coming up over Bruner Hill and down the other side, I not only see the hills that are right here in front of me, I can also see the next layer of hills. And then, on a clear day, not today, there's another layer of hills. When we read Isaiah, we can see that the first people of Israel are in exile. That's who this uh, chapter is written to, in fact, the book, to people in exile. God is encouraging them not to give up hope because they're still his people. He still has a plan to save them. But when we look at it some more from the perspective of the New Testament, we realize that this book, this prophecy, goes beyond the physical nation of Israel to the one who stands in their place. And even in the New Testament, we can see that this prophecy is for us as well. So let's look at this close range of mountains, the Israelites. They're in exile in Babylon. And I'm sure they're feeling pretty depressed because Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is gone, and it really seems like God has forsaken them. They're down and out. How do you encourage someone who's down and out, who has no hope for the future, who has no confidence that God cares about them one little bit? You go to the Word of God. You go to the book of Isaiah this morning, you go to our scripture that has the exact words that the people of Israel needed to hear. Listen to the Lord who created you, O Israel, the one who formed you. First, God reminds them where they've come from. You know, nothing in this world just happens by accident, especially the nation of Israel. They're not just a bunch of people who grew up in the same place at the same time, like maybe some other nations are. God created them. He formed them. Think back to the story of Abram. He was called to leave his home and build a new family in a new nation. Israel was chosen by God. And the good news for each and every one of us is we are chosen as well. Ephesians in the New Testament, it says it like this. Even before he created the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance 
to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. We didn't, you and I, or the people of Israel, didn't influence God's plan to save us. He saved us according to his plan, a plan that he planted in his mind from the very beginning, long before we ever existed, before Israel ever existed. We are God's chosen people, just like Israel was. He made them, and as we find them in today's scripture, in exile, he has plans for them, and he tells them, I have redeemed you. As we look down in this passage to verse 3, we see just how he did it. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Remember back to Moses in the Exodus where God totally defeated the Egyptians in order to save his people from slavery? Ethia and Seba are on the outer skirts parts of Egypt. God spared nothing. He went to the extremities of Egypt to release his people and to redeem them. It's like God bought the Israelites' freedom at the expense of the entire nation of Egypt. Even, think again, even the firstborn sons of Egypt. All were sacrificed. All were given to ransom Israel from bondage. Then God says, I have called you by name, and you are mine. You know, names are a very important thing in Jewish culture and in history, and calling someone by name indicates that there's a personal relationship with that person. When Dave and I had our first son, Zach, we named him after the bonds in Dave's line and lineage. We went back into history. Zachary Bond Simpson. He carries his dad's last name, but he carries his grandma's maiden name. It's part of the relationship that we have with that generation. When, Z when Joshua came along, he was named Joshua McCown. That went on to my, my family's side. My grandmother was a McCown. But yet, Joshua's a Simpson. And Laura, Laura's named for several Lauras, his grand, her grandmother and a dear friend named Laura, and then her middle name is Kathleen, and that's for my Aunt Kathleen, and she's a Simpson. Each one of those names is relative to the relationship that we had with and have with those people. In Genesis, what did Adam do? He named all the animals as a sign that they were going to be his companions, that he was going to take care of them, and they were going to serve him, and it was a relationship. Israel was called by name. You know, it's like being in gym class. I want to take you back to that hateful time in your life. Ugh. You know, gym uniforms for the girls, they were awful. At least in my day and age. They were flamingo-colored. It was awful. Nobody liked to wear them. But you were in gym class, and we had to line up in a row and say we were going to play volleyball. There were two team captains, and they had to pick their team. God was picking his team, much like the team captains picked their team. The captains would choose who they wanted, and here God is choosing his team. And Israel is on it, and God says, you are mine. But God didn't stop there. Next, he told them that he would be with them. In verse 2, God said, at the worst moments of your lives, at the moments when you're under the greatest pressure, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be with you. When you pass through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you pass through the fires of oppression, you won't be burned up. No matter how bad it gets, I will be there. I will be with you. I will be protecting you. He doesn't say that they won't get wet. He doesn't say that they won't get singed by the flame, but he does say that the flames won't consume them. The waters won't overtake them. Sometimes we fall into the bad habit 
of thinking, expecting God to protect us from any and all harm, that he will steer all evil of the world away from us. But he doesn't promise that. He doesn't say that we'll never have to walk through the rivers or pass through the flames. It's just the opposite. What he says is a four-letter word, when. That word means it's going to happen, right? He says, when deep waters happen, when fire happens, I will be there beside you, and I will make sure that this experience doesn't destroy you. You have to reach out to me and trust me, and I will be there for you. There's a popular poem, sometimes it's on a poster, and it's called Footsteps in the Sand. Anybody familiar with it? Okay. If you've read it, you know that it speaks of two sets of footsteps changing into a single set every now and then. And that single set of footprints is supposed to be the times when God carries us on his shoulders, when we are too weak and too tired and too poor in spirit to make it on our own. He lifts us up and he carries us. And that's the truth. He does do that from time to time. But it also may be that in those times, that's when God is standing on the sideline, watching the cauldron burn, watching the flames flicker and rise. And perhaps he reaches out with his ladle from time to time and removes some of the impurities. In the old text, it says the dross the stuff that needs to be burned off. He takes it and scrapes it off, and he makes sure the temperature doesn't get so hot that we're damaged by it. That's what he says will happen to the nation of Israel. That's what he says will happen for us. He will be with them in the waters, and when they pass through the flames, they will not be consumed. He is there. That knowledge made me breathe, literally, a big sigh of relief. It's like I breathed that promise in and I was able to be calm again. And then, he's not done, there are the words of real comfort when God says, you are precious to me. In Sunday school this morning, the kids sang red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. That's why he watches over them. That's why he watches over you. You are precious in his sight. Here are a people who have been banished to Babylon in disgrace, and God is angry with them. Don't get me wrong. He's got some righteous anger, Dave. I get it. For their repeated disobedience and their idolatry and their corruption, but at the same time, he loves them. And he says they are honored. How can God honor them when he's punishing them? It's all because of love. God loved them, and that's the good news. He loves us and well and chooses us, not because of what we have done or what we will do, not of our good intentions or, or because of how good we are, but because of who he is, because he has an enormous capacity to love. It's all about him. He chose them. He formed them. He redeemed them so that they would always be honored in his eyes. And he loved them so much that he would give nations in exchange for their lives. Even if they were scattered to the ends of the earth, to the north and the south, the east and the west, God would rescue them and bring them back even at the expense of the nations who held them captive. Through the scripture, God said, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. You and I, each one of us is part of the four corners of the earth. And through Jesus Christ, we are pleased, we are fortunate to be found in that number a number that included the people to which this word was first written, first spoken, and to their descendants in all the corners of the earth. 
We are included in God's future vision and plan, and it's all because of Jesus. He's the one who was ransomed. He's the one who was given up for us. God sent his only begotten son to set us free, to die as a ransom to set us free from the punishment due for our sin because we are idolatrous and we are disobedient and we don't listen and we sin. At his baptism, we see just how futuristic, just how far-reaching God's prophecy and plan was. Today's uh, scripture from Luke, the gospel reading says this, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to tie the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat and his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area and gather the wheat into his barn, burning the chaff with a never-ending fire. And one day, when the crowds had gathered and were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized, and he was praying, and the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly beloved Son, and you, you bring me great joy. Do any of those words remind you of the prophecy from Isaiah? As he passed through the waters of baptism, a voice comes from heaven and says, You are my beloved. You bring me joy. With you, I am pleased. You are precious in my sight. And you are honored. And I love you. John also points out that he will baptize with fire. In Isaiah, God promises to be with us in the fire. That means the fires of life and the fires that burn off our impurities just as the dross is removed from ore as it's heated. The prophecy in Isaiah stretches on into the future to encompass not just the people of Israel, not just Jesus, who is called the true Israel, but to you and me as well, and to our children and to our grandchildren, we are the ones who will be brought back to God from the four corners of the earth. When you find yourself in a situation where you wonder whether God is with you or not, or whether God cares about what's happening to you in your life, read these words and that remember, though God wrote them to Israel in the seventh century BC, they're still true for each and every one of us who calls him by name. You and I are precious in his sight. He knows you and he has named you as his. No matter what happens, no matter how hard your life is, God will watch over you. And in the end, we are promised a place with him in his kingdom forever. You are his magnificent creation. Matt, are we ready? Matt's going to turn down the lights. There's a, there's a video, a short one, I think it's about five minutes long. So I ask your patience with it, and it's called God's Chisel. And it, it really called to me as I prepared the sermon this morning, as I talked to the kids, about us leaving what's not in our best interest behind and being the people of God that he calls us to be.